Grunge. I'm, I'm the executive director of Kenya Connect here in the United States. And I'm thrilled to have members of Kenya Connect as well as members of the Mother's Day movement with us to talk about our girl boy empowerment program. Um, so let me introduce our speakers for the evening. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our friends from the Mother's Day movement, um, Kim and Stephanie. And would you like to say a few words? Sure, hi, my name is Kim hausman -Athen. And my name is Stephanie Norton, and we are so proud to partner with Kenya Connect for our 2022 Mother's Day campaign. And we have James Musioka with us from Kenya, and I think it's 2 a.m. if I'm correct with my time change. Yes, you're right. Uh, <laughs> good morning or good evening, depending on where you're tuned in. My name is James Musioka. I'm a co-founder and the executive director for Kenya Connect. It's a honor to have you tonight. And we are privileged to be partnering with the Mother's Day movement. Thank you. I want to introduce Faith. Good morning from Kenya. It's already Friday. Uh, my name is Faith Doucette. I am the director of partnerships and mentorship at Kenya Connect and the head of the Girl Boy Empowerment Program. We are thrilled to be here. And we're gonna to begin tonight's program with Kim and Stephanie sharing a little bit about the Mother's Day movement. Um, it's a wonderful uh, movement that we're very proud and humbled to be a part of. And they've been working tirelessly for the last 11 years, is it? Um, to honor mothers um, and really honor mothers and women around the world. So Kim and Stephanie, um, excited to have you here. Thank you, Sharon. And again, we are so thrilled to be joining and partnering with Kenya Connect this year. As Sharon said, way back in 2010, Mother's Day Movement was founded by a group of women after reading the book, Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wuda. The book discussed that women are the cornerstone of their communities. And if they are presented with opportunities, they are not able to, they are not only able to change their own lives, but elevate and improve the lives of families in their communities. After reading the book, we were inspired to go out and make sustainable changes. We believed we could raise funds to help change the lives of families in need around the world. But how would we do this? Change slide, Emma. As if lightning struck in Nick Kristoff's 2010 Mother's Day column, he wrote that $14 billion was spent annually in the US on items such as flowers, cards, and candy we knew our movement had been born. The mission of the Mother's Day movement is to ask people to rethink their giving on Mother's Day. Why not send six flowers instead of 12 to that special someone and use the remaining funds to help another mother in need? As Nick Kristoff said it best, it is time to move the apostrophe so that it becomes not just Mother's Day honoring a single mother, but an occasion to try and help mothers around the globe as well. Change the slide, Emma. So as Stephanie said, and Nick Kristoff said so well, we have moved the apostrophe to the end of the S to make it not just about a single mother, but about all mothers. So since 2011, our over 3000 donors have helped 11 not-for-profit organizations and raised over $850,000. The money we have raised has benefited mothers and children from Kenya to India, to Guatemala, to right here in the United States. Our donors have enabled our partners to build schools, install running water in homes, and prevent maternal mortality and injury during childbirth. Can I change the slide? Mother's Day Movement is an entirely volunteer organization, and all funds go directly to our annual beneficiary, which is Kenny Connect this year. This means that 100% of your donation is used to help mothers and children in need. Sadly, Today, 11 years after we started the Mother's Day movement, Mother's Day spending has grown to a staggering $28 billion. That's double from where we started. So we obviously have a lot of work to do. Which brings us to our 2022 Mother's Day movement beneficiary, Kenya Connect. We could not be more excited, as Stephanie said, to partner with Kenya Connect this year to help empower young women to choose when they become mothers. This will be accomplished through a multi-pronged program involving teachers, parents, and community members to teach girls and boys about healthy relationships, 
violence prevention, and sexual reproductive information. I now will turn it over to James, who, as you know, is live from Kenya, where it's 2 a.m., where he will tell you, and he and Faith will tell you a lot more about this amazing program that, that they have built. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to talk more about the work of Kenya Connect. I, uh, Tim Gregory and I co-founded Kenya Connect in 2002 as a pen program that was meant to connect children around the world. And since then, the program has grown and expanded to many other programs, but uh, PenPal Connection still remains the heart of our work. Next slide. So our mission is to engage and empower students and teachers in rural communities to be successful in the 21st century. Uh, we mainly work to break down barriers in education by providing enrichment programs in our partner schools. We work with 50 primary schools and 12 uh, secondary schools, all public, a total of uh, 62 schools with over a population of 18,000 students and over 500 teachers. Next slide. So Kenya Connect is an NGO based in Kenya and we are locally driven and by our, the work of our passionate staff who are very dedicated. We have a team of 12 staff and four volunteers. And in the US, we are 501C C3, which is based in Maryland and read, led by Executive Director Sharon Ranch and the Board of Directors. Next slide. So as I said, we started as a PENPO program, connecting uh, students in one school in Kenya and one school in the United States. But from then we have, we blossomed and we are, to date we have over 133 schools that have participated since 2002 with over 1,041,034 letters that have exchanged hands. And our main goal of our PENPO program was to um, uh, have our students have an opportunity to exchange and improve their writing skills because English language is our third language here in Kenya. Next slide. So we, our, our first program since we started was um, water tanks. When the, when the children in the US learned that our, the, the, the students in Kenya had to fetch water after leaving school or collect firewood, they decided to do a program to help them at school. And the first one was the building of a water tank. And this was the birth of our sponsorship program. Since then, we have had 55 water tanks installed in schools. Next slide. Yeah, we, after the start of Kenya Connect programs, our main, prog uh, our main programs was mainly school renovations. Uh, to put some context, around 2003, the government of Kenya introduced pre and compulsory pre-primary education. And as a result, we there was a boost in enrollment of the schools, but then the, the, the school infrastructure remained in total dilapidation. And so one of our main works in the in early years was to reno, renovate classrooms, which were did not have cemented floor, did not have windows. So as you can see, the before and after photos it clearly shows what we were doing in our early years. Next slide. We also provided uh, students with desks and teachers with chairs and tables for learning. Over 10 schools uh, were provided with this uh, basic infrastructure. Next slide. We're also providing school uniforms to needy and orphan uh, students. Although the, 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 the education was free, still uh, it's basic things like school uniform was the, the, the requirement of the parent to provide. And so for the need uh, for the orphaned children, this was something they didn't have and we 
or providing school uniforms to these needy students. Next slide. Also providing uh, games and sporting equipment like soccer balls, netball, um, javelin, discus, among others to all the schools. Next slide. But then in 2012, we built the Kenya Connect Learning Resource Center. We opened it doors to the public. We started building this in 2011. And we shifted our focus from uh, improving school infrastructure to providing quality educations. Uh, again, there was a, a shift in, uh, in, uh, in, in our government because that's about, that was about the time we started the county governments and there were some devolved funds that were coming to the schools to, to provide for infrastructure improvement. Next slide. So one of our key uh, programs has been uh, literacy. Literacy program and building a culture of reading. In Kenya, we jokingly say that if you want to have something from a Kenyan, hide it in a book because we'd, we've not developed a, a good culture of reading. So in 2017, we bought a bus, what, which we call the magic school bus to provide uh, books into, to schools. And in 2018, we began the library card program and mobile library. Uh, we, we went out to schools and talked to parents about the importance of reading and early literacy. We shared with them our plan to bring books and they, were, they embraced the idea and by subscribing their children to our library program through paying a dollar. The dollar fee helps to subsidize the cost of the card and also ensure that the parents have the skin in the game. In, in the game. A library card is uh, electronic and we use the library word to check out books, to check in and check out books. Uh, since then, we have been having uh, school book days uh, once after a fortnight. Our team takes books to the schools and every student who is a member of a library can borrow up to two books. Uh, we have grown our library membership uh, now to uh, about 5,000 members in 25 of our partner schools. And our, we have built our collection of books from 500 books to over like now 30,000 books. This week, we just received a container of 20,000 books. And that was a big, that will be a big boost to our literacy program. Besides, we've also been having fun book enrichment days where our librarian goes to the schools or welcomes students who are members of our library and we do fun activities with our library members. All this is geared towards um, improving, uh, I mean, building a culture of reading. We also do um, book ch reading challenge where once every year we invite members of our library to read as many books as possible from the month of June to um, end of August, three months. And at the end of it, we choose students who has read many books and we crown them as the king and queen reader. Uh, another program that we have also been doing to promote literacy is the read, Radio Read Aloud. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when schools shut down and our students did not have any, uh, any opportunity for learning, we began the Radio Read Aloud in June, 2020. And we welcomed uh, our students to read aloud a book and we had a follow-up lesson where the teacher uh, made up a lesson and the students tuned in and they called, they called uh, live from the radio station. We've heard from the radio station that during every um, radio read aloud, which is usually aired on Saturday, every Saturday, uh, uh, that about 400,000 listeners are tuned in, which is a huge number. We've continued this uh, radio read aloud, especially even up to, to date, and we normally do it during the school breaks. 
like now when schools are closed, we are having Radio Read Aloud every Saturday. And all our recordings are posted on our website so you can tune in and listen to them. Um, next slide. We, we know that to build a culture of reading is not just about providing books. Uh, community, in our community, most homes do not have electricity. And so we, dis, we, we, we started a, a solar rent to home program where we provide a solar lamp to a family at a cost of $8. Usually an average family will spend about $4 a month to, on kerosene, which is dirty and not clean uh, on, uh, to light their homes. So we provide uh, this solar lamp and the families have to pay $2 a month. So after four months, they have completely, uh, they completely hone the lamp and they can save money for not buying kerosene. Again, this provides a clean source of energy. So that's how we've been bu uh, building uh, the culture of reading. And we've, we've, we've heard from families that uh, after we provided the solar lamps, uh, the students are now spending one and a half hours reading uh, than prior when they used to read only for 30 minutes, which is like, uh, like uh, over 100% increment in the time of reading. Next slide. Another, another, another way we've been promoting literacy is through the lead clubs. Uh, currently, we have a dozen of lead clubs. Uh, these, are, uh, these are clubs that are gender exclusive, where we are promoting, providing a, a free space for boys and girls to develop confidence and develop their strong voices. Um, just this week, we had the first cohort of our lead clubs graduate. Uh, as I said, we have we now have a dozen of lead clubs, and we've heard from teachers that the students who are part of these lead clubs have, re have really changed in terms of their confidence levels, in terms of being uh, able to ask questions in class, and even parents and teachers have attested to this. Alongside, we also started what we call the lead moms. In, in, in conjunction with the lead world who, who, who provide the curriculum. And the lead, lead moms are also doing a similar curriculum and we are working with two lead mom groups. The goal is to empower these mothers to be able to support their children in education. At the same time, we are also, they are also doing small um, savings to start a micro enterprise for themselves. Next slide. At the Kenya Connect Learning Resource Center, we also have a computer lab that has 39 interconnected computers. We provide basic computer skills to students as an after school program. And also we also provide coding because coding is now one of the topics that are taught in grade five. Next slide. We are also offering other enrichment programs on STEM, like we are partnering with Le uh, Level Up Village based in Connecticut, USA, to provide uh, STEM courses like um, engineering, global or global water and others. And all these uh, courses are trying to make the students to think out, out of the box and to, uh, in be involved in hands-on activities while at the same time connecting with their peers through video letters. And again, this is another, has been another game changer where we have seen our students' confidence levels highly boosted. Next slide. Professional teacher development has been part of our work. Uh, learning, most learning in Kenya uh, uh, has been wrought, and uh, our goal has been to introduce 21st century teaching and learning strategies uh, among the teachers, which we started doing since like 2000, uh, 2012 up to to date. And we've seen teachers embrace the new teaching methodologies and uh, students have be become more engaged in learning. And 
class, classroom have, be, have come, become live through uh, the professional learning communities. Next slide. So uh, we also started what we call the Empower School program. Uh, naturally, uh, in Kenya, the private academies or private schools have been the ones that have been excelling in uh, national exams. And the main reason is because uh, these schools have more resources and their teachers are constantly on professional development. So we, we thought like we can't, our students all cannot afford to be in academies. And we started the Empower School model where we are working with the public schools, but we are providing extra enrichment by providing extra resources, providing weekly professional teacher development, and this one has been the game changer. The schools, currently we are working with six schools who are part of Empowered Schools, and they have they've been doing very well in our national exams because the teachers have received extra enrichment through the professional development. Uh, we have a PLC coordinator who goes to the schools and conducts workshops. We are also providing other platforms for teachers to online platform for teachers to learn about 21st century uh, teaching and learning strategies. Next slide. Again, uh, as we said, our work is mainly to, to break down barriers. We have been, since 2010, we've been providing hand washing station to schools as a way of um, ensuring students can have a healthy lifestyles in schools. We, we've been uh, promoting this through a song that we say, if you are healthy and you know, wash your hands. Because most of the germs are transmitted through hands. And so we've noted that by providing hand washing stations, we, pro we ensure the students are frequently attending school and um, they are doing well in their, in their studies. So during the COVID times, um, hand washing became like real because students schools had to, to have hand washing stations. And we, during the COVID time, we changed our design to be hands-free. So what you can see at the bottom, the photos, those are paid operated hand washing stations that we started providing at the schools. We also teaching them about how to make liquid soap so that they can sustain the hand washing practice, both at, at the school and even at their homes. Next slide. Another way of breaking down barriers is providing wings for reusable sanitary pads. Our programs have been informed by uh, what we hear from our teachers. So we heard from our head teachers meetings that many girls were not attending school, maybe three or four days in a month because they lacked uh, sanitary pads. And one of our board members, currently one of our staff, Faith Doucette, helped to come up with this program, a product we are calling Wingspoor, which is a reusable sanitary pad. Next slide. So these products are actually made uh, uh, sold up by women in our local community that helps to boost um, the local economy. And our, our staff usually goes to the schools and teach uh, and conduct trainings on menstrual health hygiene to the students and teachers on how to use uh, the kids. And we provide them for free to the girls up to, to date, we have provided over a thousand kids uh, to our girls in primary schools and secondary schools. Next slide. Another program we do to break down barriers is dewarming. We do quarterly dewarming in about 34, 32 schools among our partner schools. And this is to control intestinal worms and to ensure that students are in school we believe that a healthy mind resides in a healthy body. So that has been a matter and guiding principle for providing uh, the warming medication to students. Next slide. We've also introduced 
a new sanitation system called combos toilets. If you've never seen a combos toilet, it's just like a modern uh, sitting toilet. But instead of flushing the waste, you use a cover material, which is sawdust. So we partnered with Give Love to introduce combos toilets in our communities. Currently, we have uh, the three schools that are, com are completely uh, using uh, combos toilets. And we have over 30 homesteads who are using this sanitation system. The good thing about this sanitation system is that combos toilets do not produce smell. They don't collapse, especially during rain season because there's no pit under the ground. And again, this is sustainable in that the compost is the, the, the compost is treated as fertilizer that is used to grow crops. And so the cycle repeats. We say poop belongs in the loop. Next slide. So we are excited this year that we are celebrating our 20th anniversary. And we are opening the library learning center, which we, we started building um, last year, thanks to many donors who have made this project a reality. This is the first community library in the region, which will be hosting a makerspace, a sound studio, meeting rooms, staff offices, and the very top will have a meeting space at the rooftop to conduct teacher workshops, meetings with parents, etc. Next slide. So at this point, I want to introduce Faith, who will be talking about the Girl and Boy Power Empowerment Program, which is a comprehensive strategy to combat teen pregnancy and sexual violence. So I want to welcome you, Faith. Thank you, James. If you're just joining us, my name is Faith Doucet, the Director of Partnerships and Mentorship at Kenya Connect and the Head of the Girl Boy Empowerment Program. I'll be talking about teen pregnancy in Kenya and our comprehensive program to address the issue. But we, before we do that, let's take a poll. Next slide, please. Sharon. Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon Runge. I'm the executive director in the United States, and we have a little poll for you to take. So you should see it up on your screen right now. Um, we've got three questions. So if you could take a moment and answer the poll, um, that would be wonderful. The first question is, how many pregnancies were recorded in Mach Machacos County during the school shutdown from March to June? The second question is, how many girls became pregnant in the Wamunyu cluster of schools? And our third question is, why did teen pregnancy spike? So if you take a few minutes to answer those questions, I can see that we have people answering now. Um, About half of you have completed, so um, take a few moments and um, answer the questions. Hey, I'm gonna end the poll right now. And I'm gonna share the results. Can you all see the results? Yes. 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 Okay. So um, if you answered that 396, 3,964 people um, became pregnant, girls became pregnant, that is the correct answer. Um, which was stunning and why we started looking into teen pregnancy in our community. 
Um, when we looked into um, the issue of teen pregnancy in our community, uh, we were really stunned to find out 98 girls at our schools, um, 26 of those 98 were in primary school, which means they were in grades six, seventh and eighth grade who became pregnant, um, which really alarmed us. Um, and then as we started doing research to find out why did this teen pregnancy spike, if you answered all of the above, which many of you did, that was the correct answer. It's a, it's a complex problem. It's not just one, one reason fits all. Next slide, please. So before Faith talks about the program a little bit, I wanna give it a, a huge, huge shout out um, to the C C Circle of Sisterhood Foundation. Um, in 2021, they gave us a $10,000 grant to launch the program. Um, we had submitted a proposal talking about the Girl Boy Empowerment Program. We needed some funding to begin working with our students and working with our parents. And the Circle of Sisterhood, which is um, women in sororities around our country, um, and then they give grants out to organizations like our, ours, selected us and we were thrilled. So kudos to the Circle of Sisterhood because part of their funding helped us be able to talk to the Mother's Day movement. So we're, we're really thrilled. Um, and I also wanna give a shout out to the University of New Hampshire. We have been consulting with them on how to, how to do research in our community, um, how best to ask stakeholders or ask students and community members what was going on. So they're still working with us on the design process. Um, so we um, are grateful to our UNH faculty for participating with us. Next slide. Yeah, so as Shen mentioned, 3,964 girls became pregnant in Chacos County over a period of three months uh, when schools were locked down during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And as an organization, uh, we knew that we had to involve the community in finding a solution. So we held two meetings with our community partners to try and figure out a way forward. And these meetings included a child protection officer, the police, com a community health nurse, public health officer, local pastors, village leaders, teachers, and the local media. During the meetings, the community partners clearly expressed they were expecting and or hoping that Kenya Connect would uh, take a lead to find a solution. So the next step for us was to go out into the community and talk to students, teachers, uh, parents, and members of the community. Next slide, please. So following those two meetings, our Girl Boy Empowerment uh, team went out and conducted 43 interviews and collected qualitative data using in-depth interviews. Next slide. So this is Reverend Benjamin, he's one of our community partners and we are collaborating with him in an effort to reach parents and other members of the community. My name is uh, Reverend Benjamin Musioki. Uh, I minister with Africa Inner Church in Wamonyo and I want to uh, thank God for this uh, opportunity talk about the unfortunate incidents that we have been facing uh, over the last um, uh, few years uh, and especially uh, the issue of the teenage pregnancies. It has really uh, worked um, negatively on the, the community, especially the, 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 the teenage girls Majority of them are uh, dropping out of school, uh, never to go back again because they, they lack, um, you know, support. Uh, they lack, uh, you know, direction. They lack proper guidance, maybe from their parents, some of them who are old, uh, others are semi-literate and maybe may not get the importance of education. <clears throat> and therefore, 
uh, majority of them uh, have uh, found themselves in the unfortunate state of, uh, you know, the, 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 what I would call the vicious circle. Uh, because once, uh, 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 some of them are children of dropouts. Maybe their parents also did drop out earlier in, uh, yeah, from school. Uh, because they don't have a proper uh, means of livelihood, they cannot support their children. And now when the girl is uh, uh, at puberty stage, at adolescence, uh, they found themselves having some needs that the parents maybe cannot provide. And therefore they get uh, uh, enticed, <clears throat> you know, by irresponsible, uh, you know, people in the society, in the community. Unfortunately, some of them may be people whom the girls would have uh, depended upon uh, for guidance. They would have depended upon maybe for support, but some uh, take advantage of their vulnerability. Uh, hence, uh, you know, luring them and uh, leading them astray uh, from what maybe the girl had approached them for. And therefore, they end up, uh, you know, in this unfortunate state. <clears throat> And therefore, uh, I want to say that um, it is very important uh, that uh, the people who care, the people who uh, mind about the welfare of the boy, my girl, boy, child uh, empowerment, to come in and uh, empower the children with life skills, empower the children with uh, a proper knowledge, uh, you know, encourage them, motivate them, to realize that uh, no matter the circumstance, the situation that they are going through, uh, they can uh, they can make it in life despite uh, the environment where they have been brought up. It might be uh, a poor environment, uh, but if someone comes into their lives and uh, encourages them, you know, guides them, gives them uh, some moral uh, teachings, and also uh, tries to assist them to get some life skills. Um, alongside uh, literacy, uh, that could really help a great deal. And that is why I'm saying that uh, this program is coming in handy because it will try to bridge the gap uh, and therefore uh, make the society a better place and especially looking at the future of the young uh, girls. So uh, I want to say uh, it's a program that is, uh, is very much uh, helpful is a program that will uh, go a long way, you know, to salvage, uh, you know, the situation and uh, give hope, uh, give direction, uh, give, uh, you know, uh, you know, a smile, put a smile in the life of the girl and the boy, uh, uh, child in our society. My name is... Uh, Yes, so from the data we collected through the interviews, we identified the underlying drivers of teen pregnancy and developed several initiatives to address the issue. Some of those drivers include inadequate sexual health education, gender-based violence, poverty, you know, girls exchanging sex for pads and, and food, and parental negligence, among others. Next slide, please. So in January of this year, we launched the Girl Boy Empowerment Program to decrease teen pregnancy, break the cycle of violence, and improve literacy. We are piloting the program in four schools and currently have eight clubs with a total of 173 students. Next slide, please. So the Girl Boy Empowerment Clubs are gender exclusive. We want students to be uh, able to express themselves without fear of judgment from the opposite gender. So these are two mentors for the, uh, for the program, Jacqueline and David. Hello everyone. My name is Jacqueline Mudoka, working at Kenya Connect and the Girl Boy Empowerment Program. It is exciting to work with children. You learn a lot from them as they learn from you and it is fulfilling especially when you see them so eager to learn. As a girl boy empowerment program mentor, I have watched the girls in our pilot schools come out of their shells. They are learning to be confident, to have self-esteem, 
and handle peer pressure. They love the read aloud sessions and participate in community building activities. These girls have found a way to express their dreams and goals through vision sports through the program. One girl said her dream is to wear a graduation cap and gown. She wants to work hard to go to university. Another one said she wants to help people when she grows up. Interesting, some said they would like to work for Kenya Connect to help other children in the community, stating that wonderful things happen in Kenya Connect. It is an absolute honor to empower these girls to make informed decisions as a mentor. My hope and dream are for this program to be launched in other schools and see these girls achieve their dreams and become agents of change in the community. Thank you. Jumbo. My name is David Kemanzi with Kenya Connect, working under Girl Boy Empowerment Program. Teenage pregnancy remains a complex issue, not only in Machakos County, but in the whole country. So we developed the, the Girl Boy Empowerment Program to reduce teen pregnancies and improve literacy in our community. We have piloted the program in four schools and are working with a total of eight clubs and 173 students. A few weeks ago, during a peer pressure session, I asked the group of boys I mentor who is affected by peer pressure. Some of the boys said peer pressure affects people over 19 years. Then after I explained what peer pressure is, they began to share their personal stories. One boy said he was stealing mangoes because his friends were doing it and had not realized that peer pressure is the sense of wanting to do what other people are doing. I am excited that we are addressing the issue of teen pregnancy and empowering the students to make informed decisions. There is a great need for this program in our community, and I hope we can roll out the program in our partner schools and make it a multi-year program to impact more students. Thank you. So one of the objectives of the Garbo Empowerment Program is to improve literacy. So we incorporate read aloud session in each uh, lesson. And this clip was taken after a read aloud session. Today I learn I am enough. I am enough. Uh, each club has a chaperone and we encourage the chaperones to pop in our sessions now and then to uh, see what the students are learning. And so hear from teacher Catherine after ob observing one of the sessions. I'm teacher Catherine from Lema Primary School, one of the schools benefiting from Girl Boy Empowerment Program. We had problems of early teen pregnancies. Right now we have a girl who is 13 years old, she is pregnant in class 7. Early last year, the Kenya Connect visited our schools and we had talks with them. They later came up and started the program. And actually, the program is going on. And yesterday, I happened to be privileged to attend the sections. What I saw was very beneficial to the kids, and I hope in future it will reduce the number of pregnancies that we, uh, we use it to have. Thank you. So period poverty is still a massive issue in this country. And as Jane mentioned in 2016, we launched the wings for reusable sanitary pads to keep girls in school and break barriers to education. Uh, as you mentioned, the pads are made by local women, thus boosting the local economy. And we currently have 25 schools participating in the reusable sanitary pads program. Uh, when schools reopen next month, we'll be issuing an additional uh, 131 kits to students next month. And I must mention that these kits are free to the students. Next slide, please. For our program success, we must have parents and community buy-in. When we invited parents to talk about the Girl, Empowerment Pro the Girl Boy Empowerment Program, 
we ask them if they talk to their children about sex matters and they would not even look us in the eye, but wanted us to go out to the schools and talk to their children about sex matters. You know, sex, the to sex topic is still taboo in rural communities. And we hope that when we launch the parent program on sexual health and education, that will change some mindsets and attitudes towards the subject. Next slide, please. So when we were conducting the interviews, we learned parents were traveling far for work, leaving children home alone and vulnerable. So we developed several income generation initiatives for parents. We currently have a group of uh, women uh, sewing laptop bags and doormats, and we hope to launch the other initiatives in beekeeping, uh, raising goats and chickens soon. Next slide, please, Sharon. Thank you, Faith. Um, the final part of the program is really trying to develop more resources to help um, with the program, but also working more closely with the police, the community nurse, child protection, um, other people in the community to spread the world, word that violence against girls, teen pregnancy is not okay. Um, there's been, in the past, people have looked the other way when this has happened, or you know, when uh, an adult has gotten a young woman pregnant, he might say, I'll give you some goats and you know, the families will settle it. But it, it just continues that cycle of maternal um, poverty. Um, so we're gonna be working as a community to tackle the issue. And part of that we'll be doing a media campaign. So we'll be, be, we'll be working on our social media channels, on the radio station. Um, we're talking about creating some billboards to have people think twice about what it means having sex when you're not ready to have sex. And especially for our vulnerable girls, you know, making sure that it's that they're safe and that if there's a problem, where do they go to get help? Um, so we're excited. Um, that's part three of the whole program, um, but we're excited that we're gonna be able to not just provide programming, but look at some of the systemic reasons. Next slide. And so this is a, a moment um, where you can ask questions. You can put them in the chat. Um, since we have a, 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 a manageable group, we can also open it up so you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question um, to Faith or to James or to the Mother's Day movement. Um, we'd love to hear if you have any thoughts or questions. You can put it in the chat or you can just um, ask a question. That's a great question. Okay, the question in the chat is, for girls who got pregnant and had their child, how many of them go back to school? Um, Faith, do you have a sense of that? Yes, so most of them return to school with an exception of a few, but generally most of them go back to school. Um, the laws changed a while ago. So yeah, if you get pregnant, you're allowed to go back to school. Just you to add on what Faith has said, uh, yes, the law allows, but uh, you still find these girls are challenged because you know, from a health perspective, they are required to breastfeed for like six months. So uh, if they go back to school, maybe the grandmother or the guardian will have to bring the baby to school for breastfeeding. You know, this mother needs special diet. So there's, although the law is there still, there are so many other challenges that come into play that may make this girl not go back to school. Maybe until maybe the child is one year old. And and do you find that um, when the girls go back, if other children know that she had become pregnant, are they stigmatized? And who watches their children or their child when they go to school? Do you have a sense of that? 
uh, maybe said you change him in, but uh, generally, yes, there's been that stigma. Um, although now the Ministry of Education is trying to say that these children should not be should not be uh, stigmatized by either teachers or even fellow students. Uh, they just taken uh, uh, received back as students, but naturally it will st there will still be a stigma, and the girl will need courage to overcome this stigma. Maybe Faith, you can add more. Yes. So as James mentioned, there is still stigma, and uh, when we were conducting the interviews, we asked the head teachers of the schools that we went to how they are handling the situation. Uh, to make sure that girls are not being stigmatized. And they told us that they, they are making others, they are uh, creating awareness. So other students are not stigmatizing the, the girls that are returning after giving birth. We had a question, is human biology, especially um, reproduction um, included in the Kenyan curriculum? James, your faith? Yes, um, it is. It is in, included in the curriculum, although it is. It starts very, very basic. It, it starts from primary all the way to secondary, and it's layered. Uh, so, like at 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 lower grades, they just be learning about the human body, the body parts, and then it will transition like now to their functionality. So it keeps building, but I have to say, I think at the primary level, they, they, they may not have gotten enough uh, uh, knowledge uh, on reproductive reproduction uh, as, per, as per the curriculum. Well, what I would say is that although they learn the scientific, they, they, they learn the, the, the science of the content, it, it's not like internalized for the students. Maybe Faith, you can team in. Yes, so we still have to remember the, the sex topic is a taboo in this country. So uh, children don't get the opportunity to talk to their parents about it when they go home or are shy to ask questions uh, to teach us about it. And so they never get that in-depth uh, knowledge on the subject. And we're gonna just switch gears for a moment for a question um, because somebody looked at um, when James was talking about our programs, um, there was a question about compost. Um, what do we use our compost from, from the compost toilets? Um, so James, maybe you could talk about that. And somebody asked how do different seasons impact the process of composting? Well, a good question. Uh, so we've been doing the composting for the last um, like one and a half years, especially at the schools. And so our compost has to be asked was to stay um, in the compost pile for a year. So this, this year we harvested the first compost and our partners from Give Love, who were privileged to have them come and see the compost. And they said, wow, this is one of the finest compost they've ever seen. And they've been working with partners implementing compost sanitation around the world in Uganda, Ethiopia and other parts of Africa. And they said that this is one of the finest combo, compost. So, they gave us the go ahead to utilize it in planting crops. So we are we are intending to start kitchen gardens in the schools, and specifically we want to grow um, also moringa tree, which we we which, which we had already started. Like it will be a, a forestation uh, a program for the schools where we are we have the compost sanitation. So I have to say that the compost from these compost toilets will soon be utilized and we are going to have now the complete loop. We can now make, say, when we say poop belongs to the loop, now we can, we can finalize the final loop, which is to grow crops and we hit, hit them so that the loop becomes a cycle. 
Thank you, James. And Faith, um, here was a question about, you know, are the boys, men who impregnate girls um, held responsible? You know, do they contribute financially to the well being of the child? Um, and if they don't, how do the girls survive financially? Like, how do they have money to take care of themselves and their baby? Thank you, Sharon. So there's a culture of silence in this country, and um, especially if the girl is impregnated by a family member. Uh, those cases are never taken to court because the family wants to protect the family name. So for the most part, the burden falls on the girl's mother to take care of the child. And when they do go to court, they, for the most part, they settle out of court. And as Sharon mentioned earlier, they may uh, opt to receive a payment of a goat or a car, which doesn't help, but there's always that uh, stigma attached to it and wanting to protect the family name. So the man or the, the person responsible pretty much walks free and never gets to, to pay child support or be responsible for, for his actions. Thanks. Um, can we move it to the next slide? And we had a question for Kim and Stephanie. Um, the person who wrote in said that they're thrilled that Kenya Connect was selected to be your beneficiary. And how can people spread the word regarding the partnership? And are you accepting donations now or do you have to um, wait until Mother's Day? Um, so maybe you could address that question. Great, well, thank you. That, that's what we wanna do here. We want to spread the word. We, we started the Mother's Day movement. We called it a movement because we wanted it to spread. We wanted it to grow on its own. So we want all of the people on this, on this call to take our website and send it out to your email list. Um, we want you to share on, on our website. If you go to, um, you can find a fact sheet where, that you can share about our past beneficiaries and the work that we do and tell people we want, it's time to make Mother's Day about not just your own mother, your special people in your life, but about mothers in need around the world. That is the message that we want to get out. And you can donate right now on the last slide. If we go back to that, Emma, there's a QR code that you can scan and it'll go directly to the donation page, or you can access the donation page from our website, mothersdaymovement.org. Um, and the best part that we didn't talk about is that you can ask, you can request that a Mother's Day card be sent to your special honoree uh, around Mother's Day and they will to notify them of the donation that you made in their honor. So uh, it's just, it, it, it will help you get a gift out of the way uh, in advance as well. And they will get that Mother's Day card on Mother's Day or the day before. So you will know right. that they are taken care of. Thank you. And, and we'll take one more um, question because I think this is a really um, wonderful question. Um, is the community um, embracing the change in the culture around sexuality? Are they open to us talking with their children about this? Um, do you feel like that they're embracing or are they feeling like, oh, let's not talk about sex because it might encourage people to have sex? Um, do you have a sense on that, Faith and James? Absolutely. I have to say that when we had the meeting with the community partners or what we call the stakeholders, like they were, they were telling us, this is something we've always been yearning to see. Like we, we've seen girls become pregnant and nobody seems to, to be having the courage to speak out. So like they were saying, you are on the right path. Everyone we talked to said, you are on the right path. This is the way to go. As Feather said, when they talked with the parents, uh, the parents would say that they were very uncomfortable, uh, you know, discussing sexual matters with their kids. And so outrightly, they are totally embracing this uh, program because they see it coming to, uh, you know, see a gap that is already existing. Nobody seems comfortable to discuss these matters with children. So it is, I think it's, it's very timely that uh, we are doing it at this time. Although it's maybe, let me 
correct. It may not be timely because already the damage has been made, has been done, but there's still opportunity to, you know, control this from, you know, in, um, increasing in numbers in the future by empowering both boys and girls. Maybe Faith, you can add more. Yeah, just to add on uh, what James said, girls do not exist in a vacuum and we have to empower both boys and girls and we want the boys to, to advocate for the girls. And so that's why we took uh, the Girl Boy Empowerment Program and uh, the approach of empowering both. And so, yes, the parents want us to talk to their children about sexual matters. And as I mentioned, it's still uh, taboo in this uh, rural community, we're in a uh, rural community setting, but the more they, they hear about it, I think they will uh, get used to it and be comfortable. And the students, when we ask them if they talk sex matters with their parents, they told us they're afraid of asking questions uh, because the parents come from a different generation, but we are hoping uh, to change mindsets and attitudes toward the subject. And, and I'll just add that I was in Kenya in February and I met with a couple of the stakeholders, Pastor Benjamin, who you saw the video of, and also the community health nurse. And both of them said that they were really grateful to Kenya Connect because we work with so many partner schools um, and have been you know, part of the community for 20 years that were leading this effort, that they felt like you know, we had a strong voice that people trust us because of our education work. Um, and that they were happy that we were trying to bring together different groups. You know, and Pastor Benjamin said, you know, I'm really excited to work with parents at my um, church community. And I'd like to bring in some of the other pastors and, and churches um, so you can also work with them. So, you know, when you hear that from local members, you know, and the community nurse said, you know, she has seen terrible things happen when girls become pregnant, that there's not always great health outcomes for those girls, you know, and that by talking about it, especially with um, students in younger grades, in grades five and six, helps um, prepare them for when they get to secondary school. So we're, we're really um, pleased at the support we've had from the community. Um, Emma, maybe you could flip to the last slide because I know we're coming to the end of the program. Um, you know, we talked about the gifts to the Mother's Day movement. You can give at any level. So if you want to do a $10 donation, if you want to give a $2,000 donation, all, all gifts are welcome. You know, and it gives you a sense by the breakdown up on the screen of things that the money will go towards. Um, next slide, Emma. You know, in the end, um, here is our website, the QR code again. Um, but if you don't want to write this down, um, you can just Google Kenya Connect and you'll find our information or Google Mother's Day movement. Uh, we have made a recording of this presentation tonight and we'll be sending you the link to the, or, uh, to the presentation. So you're welcome to share that with your friends. It will have the additional information. If you have any questions about Kenya Connect programs um, or, or specifically the Girl Boy Empowerment Program, feel free to email Sharon at KenyaConnect.org, James at KenyaConnect.org, or Faith at KenyaConnect.org. You know, we'd be happy to further the conversation or answer your questions. And um, my friends at the Mother's Day Movement, do you want to end with some closing words? We are so happy that you are supporting Mother's Day Movement and Kenya Connect. We would love for you to make a donation in one of your special uh, honorees. And if you have any questions, you can also reach out to Stephanie or Kim at mothersdaymovement.org or info at mothersdaymovement.org. Again, spreading the word is the most important thing you can do. And if you can spread the word on social media, we would so appreciate that. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's take, let's, take the $28 billion number and start sending it to mothers in need around the world. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and a special thank you to Faith and James for yes, being you. up at 3 a.m. now in Kenya. Thank so, so Sante Sana. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.